Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm going to start. There's a lot of material to go through. So first of all, a little bit about myself. My name is Vittorio. Uh, I've been working with C++ for over 10 years. I started thanks to game development. It was a hobby for me. I like games, and I wanted to make my own. So that's how I got into this madness. I have been working at Bloomberg for a long time. And I'm currently teaching inside the company. I'm teaching modern C++ to both new hires and experienced employees. I'm the author of Embracing Modern C++ Safely. I co-authored this, this book, thank you, with uh, Lakos, Klebnikov, Meredith, many other contributors from the ISO committee. You can come ask me about this book later if you're interested. I participate in standardization, part of the Italian national body. And I love working on side projects in my free time. I'm one of those people that when you know work is done, I go home and write some C++. So I'm going to talk to you about this SFML library, which is, a, a, let's say, a multimedia library that you can use to make small games or multimedia applications. And we're going to see it as a benchmark for our compilation improvements. But there's also other projects that you can see over here. A little bit about this talk before we begin. So I'm going to tell you, first of all, why we should care about compilation times, why they are important. Then we're going to use this sort of flow chart based approach so that you can sort of like identify bottlenecks in your compilation. And I'm going to give you tools and techniques you can use to fix those bottlenecks and also how to profile them. I'm going to give a few remarks on modules. I have some slides at the end if there's time that go a little bit in more detail. But this talk is not going to cover modules. I'm going to tell you in a bit. And as I mentioned, uh, I benchmarked and measured all of these techniques on a real project, this library that is open source. So I'm going to give you some examples from that as well. What are the goals that I set with this talk? First, understand what can negatively impact build times. I'm going to provide actionable points that you can you know, use in your projects to improve your compilation times. And also sort of a call to action. You know, If you want to contribute to open source and you like a library, you like a project, but you don't really know where to start, you'd be surprised how many projects don't really care about compilation. So you can, you can contribute improvements very easily, and it can make a difference in, uh, in, uh, in, this, in these projects. And hopefully, it sparks some interesting discussion. Before we begin, I'm going to make some assumptions. First of all, I'm going to assume that you're somewhat familiar with C++ build model. You know, you should know what parallel compilation is, how the header and source files work, what linking is. I don't need, I don't need you to know all the details, but you know, have an idea of how all of this works. And also, you're somewhat familiar with C++. I'm going to assume you know what a declaration definition is, a template is, overall resolution, ODR. Does everybody here know what ODR is? OK. A lot of people. OK, you don't have to know exactly what ODR is. We're going to get there when we, when we get there. A uh, bit of a disclaimer, this talk mostly focuses on, uh, on CMake and Unix. So that's my main development environment, and also what we use both at work and for my hobby projects. And it is 100% applicable. Everything you see here, you can apply it to any sort of GNU Linux distribution, or even on Windows if you use WSL or uh, MCS2 and MGW, which is usually what I use in my hobby projects. Some details might not be applicable to MSVC if you use that, but I try to you know, give you references and links for MSVC-centric information where possible. And you know, these are mostly things I'm familiar with, things that I've actually experienced, and I you know, can prove that they work. So there might be other things that I don't cover. It doesn't mean that they are bad. It just means I might not have seen them before. Uh, feel free to interrupt me. I like to keep it interactive. So anything you want to say, just raise your hand, and hopefully we can have a discussion. And I, you know, let's let's start like this. If I run me running out of time, we can keep the, the the questions for later. Everything is you know has sources and references. The slides are available here. You're gonna see the link later as well. So when you when you want to see this, uh, you know, later on, you can just click on these references over here. You're gonna find measurements and all all that stuff. Okay, so let's begin. Why do we care about compilation times? So C++ has the reputation of being slow to compile, especially compared to some other languages. Uh, C is one example. There's a lot of diehard C fans that don't want to use C++ because they like to see their code compile as soon as possible, as quickly as possible. And there is some truth in that. And the, the idea of zero cost abstractions in the first place is kind of a, a, a misnomer, right? This abstraction can be zero cost in release mode, a runtime, but they do have a cost on build time and also on debug performance. So that's also something that we like as it makes our code more high level, but it can actually impact compilation times quite negatively. And I do believe compilation times matter. I believe it's something that people should care more about. 
We could do the math, you know, I could tell you, yeah, the average salary of a developer is X and, you know, time spent comp compiling, but everybody knows this, it's not that interesting. What also interesting, in, I find interesting is uh, thinking about CI time and power usage, right? If you're running CI for every single PR, every single commit all over the place on multiple machines and things like that, you can imagine how power usage and the time spent doing CI adds up for every uh, compilation overhead you introduce in your project, which is not good for the planet and for iteration times. And I also think it's sometimes overlooked, you know, we can make the money argument, but the frustration, the motivation you get when your code compiles quickly and you can iterate and try things out relatively fast is very nice. It makes you more productive. So how many of you have felt frustrated by compilation times? Okay, pretty much everybody. <laughs> okay, that's, that's promising. And yeah, and I feel like if you have short duration times, you can produce better products and you can be happier as a developer. I think that's, that's something important. And even on modern hardware, you know, you can say, yeah, I have like the server with uh, 40 cores and whatever. Even on this kind of modern hardware, build times can get out of hand easily. Uh, these are some measurements with uh, relatively strong setups. So you can see the details on the links. But for example, building Chromium from scratch takes 50 minutes on a very strong setup, a, a machine designed for building uh, C++ programs. GCC takes 90 minutes from a full rebuild. And NLVM is a bit better, 30 minutes, but still, this is not what I would call a fast iteration time. Now, of course, there are reasons why things are the way they are, and the, the machines are doing a lot of work, but these numbers are very high, and I think they could be improved. Uh, my claim is, after this talk, if you never care that much about build times, about compilation times, you will be able to improve them significantly by applying the techniques and tools that I give you. So, first of all, let's try to understand why compilation times can be poor in C++, what is actually the cause of this, of this problem. Uh, first thing that we have to talk about is the fact that this hash include system and the build model C++ uses has its pros and cons, but it's ultimately archaic, you know? This is basically a glorified copy-paste mechanism. The language also itself is quite complicated. If you think about the rules behind overall resolution, template instantiation, things like Sphina and so on, there is quite a lot of churn that the compiler has to do to figure out, uh, you know, the result of this sort of, um, of language rules. And I think this is one of the main culprits as well. Highly generic and abstracted libraries are very nice in terms of flexibility and user experience, but they tend to be very bulky. If you think about Boost or even the standard library, they try to you know, provide you with a lot of tools that are highly flexible, but that comes as a cost. And especially libraries like Boost, unfortunately, have the reputation of being very useful, but also people tend to shy away from them because they're gonna make their program slow to compile and bulky and things like that, and that's unfortunate. It doesn't have to be that way. There are many reasons for this. Uh, backwards compatibility as always is one, but also I've noticed it's more of a also cultural sort of thing where compilation time is not seen as a metric which is important, and library developers would not, don't really optimize for that. And sometimes this is warranted, you know, is not the priority, but like the opposite of parameter optimization, you don't have to do everything in your, in your, you know, in your tool set to make a library compile as fast as possible, but you can take some steps during development to make sure that it stays lean and relatively quick to compile. Physical design, we're gonna discuss about that as well, and basically is why would you use hash include when a forward declaration is enough? Why would you define a template in a header file when you could do that in a source file? There are ways you can sort of like design your code physically to make it um, you know, easier and faster to compile for your machines. And as I mentioned, this is also you know, a cultural sort of thing. And the standard library is also, um, I would say, guilty of this. If you think about all the work that maintainers have to do to keep the standard library up to date with the standard and things like that, it's very reasonable that they don't have compile time as a priority. But as I'm gonna show you later, sometimes even just including algorithm because you want min and max, can greatly impact the compilation overhead of a single translation unit. So sometimes you, you cannot force to not use the standard library if you want things to compile fast, and that's a bit of a shame. And again, there are solutions for this, and we're gonna talk about them soon. Let's talk about modules, just one slide, just to give you an idea, but this talk is not gonna focus on modules. In short, they will help, but we're not fully there yet. Compiler support for modules is still quite limited. I have some sources, you can check them out later. And I wouldn't say that at this point in time we can use modules on any project. You need effort to migrate, so that's also another sort of like road blocker for, for using modules. And 
you know, when we're going to get there, there are some promising computation time speedups. So there are some numbers that are promising, but still, there are trade-offs. You know, the build system, the build model that we have right now is highly parallel. Modules can also create chains of dependencies, so there are pros and cons to the two things. Module support is being actively worked on. For example, Bloomberg, the company I work for, is actively sponsoring Kitware to implement and you know, bring forward modules in the CMake ecosystem. So there's been progress made on that. You can actually, um, if you click on these links later, you can actually have a Godbolt, a Compile Explorer instance, where you can play around with CMake and modules, everything in the browser. It's very, very cool. And I have some more slides later, but I want to focus on what we have control over today before getting there. Okay. So this is the flowchart I came up with, which is sort of like um, what you should follow if you have, you know, if you're not happy with your compilation speed. We're gonna go through pretty much everything in this flowchart, and you know, you can check it out later. But I want to start step by step. So the first step is this one: we start and we ask ourselves the question: Is our compilation fast enough? And that's a surprisingly, let's say, tough question. How do you say whether something is fast enough or not? It's fairly subjective, right? In terms of possible metrics, uh, as I mentioned, we can do that sort of time cost analysis and you can sort of like look at the economical aspect of it, which is important, you should do that. But I also really value the idea of minimizing frustration and enhancing the motivation of working on a project. So if you feel like, man, I would like to work on this, but you know, it takes so long to compile, it's, it's probably not fast enough. And I felt this way for many open source projects, even just, for example, trying to contribute to LLVM if I have to think about cloning the whole thing, compiling it from scratch on a machine, maybe a laptop, it just you know, kills my motivation a bit. The other thing is like um, libraries that are lightweight and fast to compile are highly sought after, especially in game development. These sort of people really value these things. So if you make your library, if you make it a selling point of your project that is fast to compile, you might get more audience and it's sort of like a reputation marketing tool for, uh, for what you're working on. Okay, let's say you figure out that you wanna make some improvements. Let's begin with something that um, it's fairly easy to integrate in most projects. I call these low-hanging fruits. And these are basically coarse-grained changes that can significantly impact compilation times. They affect the entire project. They're sort of like you know, wide changes and they're generally easy to introduce. The first thing that I hope most of you are familiar with is replacing your build system. What do I mean by that? By default, even nowadays, if you use CMake, uh, you will be using Make as the, the program that actually ends up building your, your object file. But Make is not great. There are alternatives such as Ninja, which I'm gonna cover here, which are a drop-in replacement for Make. They perform the same, you know, sort of like actions, but they have superior schedule algorithms. They track dependencies better. They have, you know, clever ways of avoiding recomputing the same files over and over again. And uh, they can be a quite significant improvement. Ninja is available on all major platforms. You know, any platform that you might write C++ code on, Ninja is probably available there. And enabling it through CMake is so trivial that I wish it would be the default um, of, on many distributions. You just do this. You say CMake-G Ninja. Dash G stands for generator. And this basically says that you want CMake to generate build files for Ninja and not for Make or in the case of Windows for, um, for MSVC or MSBuild. And rather than calling make dash j something, which is usually the way you would invoke make in parallel, you just invoke ninja without any argument. And ninja is clever enough to figure out you know, the num number of cores in your machine and use the right number of cores to uh, build your programs. So what is the impact of something like this? Um, I was telling you before I benchmarked and tested all of these things in this talk on this library called SFML. This is a library for uh, the creation of games, multimedia applications is really nice. You know, it gives you like a small, let's say, high-level abstraction over graphics, audio, networking, and the operating system. And it's available for most major platforms, including mobile. And it's something that I, it, it's a library that helped me get into C++. So I felt like I had to give back and now I'm contributing to it and I'm part of the SFML team. It's a fairly small project, around 225 source files, but it's representative of a real project that a lot of people use. So that's why I also thought it was a good candidate for these um, benchmarks. This is my build environment. It's a fairly decent machine. And I'm using this hyperfine command line tool, which if you haven't heard about, is a nice way of benchmarking uh, command line operations. 
So these are two benchmarks of a full rebuild of SFML using Clank++, Ccache, which I'm going to talk about later, and Make in the first one, and Ninja in the second one. And as you can see here, if we use Make, we end up with a mean time of 5.9 seconds. If you use Ninja, it's less than one second. So all of this, uh, let's say these five cycles are just overhead of the build system that you're using. They are just wasted time because Make is just scheduling the jobs in a not efficient way, in a not optimal way, and it's just doing more work than Ninja. So just by doing this, you can already shave off seconds of your build time. And this is just 225 source files. So if you imagine a larger project, you will see um, a bigger, um, bigger impact. Is make with minus J or not? Yes, it's make with minus J16, which is the number of cores on my machine. You can also find other benchmarks later. Um, there's links, and you can reproduce these results in other projects. Can I ask? Yeah, of course. Is there a difference between Clang and GCC? Uh, there is a difference. So the question is, is there a difference between Clang, Clang and GCC? There is a difference, but the um, the offset of changing the build system is the same. So you still see the same improvement regardless of the compiler you used. Okay. Uh, more questions? Okay. Linker. This is also something that people might overlook. If you use the default linker on your machine, which is usually LD or even gold, these are very slow compared to LLD, which is a linker developed for the LLVM project. The reasons are fairly technical, but basically, the, 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 the linkers that are the default on machines don't really care about threads that much. They're not developed with multi-threading in mind. They don't use you know, high-performance allocation schemes and things like that. So they're just, they're just you know, not optimized to be quick. And this is a table that shows you the performance of rebuilding, sorry, relinking all these projects on a, on a fairly good machine, at, at least at the time of what, uh, where this table was created. So we have FFmpeg, MySQL, Clang, and Chromium. And I'm just gonna talk about Chromium here, but the, the, the results are similar. If you use LD to link Chromium, just linking Chromium, we have 209 seconds of just linking. If you use gold, that uses, you know, uh, you can choose it to use it in a multi-thread or multi-thread way, you get around 60 seconds, regardless of whether you use threads or not. If you use LLD in single threaded, you get 27.6 seconds. And if you use LLD with threads, you get 16 seconds. So you can see that we jump from 209 seconds down to 16.7 seconds if we just switch the linker. And again, this is a trivial change. You don't have to change anything in your code. You simply change what linker you're using. And spoiler alert, LLD is slow nowadays. I'm gonna show you something better than LLD. But it can make the difference, you know, this 0 0.35 here compared to 1.7 second feels instant. So you can, you know, iterate, make changes in your code and see them, you know, um, as, you're, as you are, you know, experimenting or something like that. Yeah. So the question is, is it actually a trivial change? Are there edge cases you need to consider when you're switching linkers? On all the projects I worked on, so I'm talking from personal experience, both at work and my hobby projects, it was completely transparent, trivial change. I cannot think of anything that can go wrong if your program is well-defined and there's nothing weird that you're doing and you know, assuming there are no bugs in the linker. I, I, so I cannot give you like a objective answer. What I can tell you is that LLD has been around for years, is a fairly you know, well mature software that is part of the LLM suite, so there should be no problems there. If anybody has a better answer, please. Yeah. So are LLD completely compatible from terms of a command line argument? It should be a drop-in replacement, yes. Thank you. So the comment is there might be differences in the embedded, uh, you know, sort of field of development. I'm not familiar with that with that field. So potentially, yeah, if you're working embedded, is something that you might want to review before doing. So when I said it's trivial, I'm I'm saying like it's trivial to turn it on. And assuming you don't have any problem, which I never encountered, it, you will get the benefits for free. But there might be edge cases which I'm not aware of. So let's let's make that clear. Now. 
what I mean by drop-in replacement is that if you CMake, all you have to do is pass this flag over here. I'm sure there's a cleaner way of doing it in modern CMake, but I think this is the only one that worked reliably on all platforms for me. You just um, say dash D CMake CXX flags, and then you say F use LD LLD. So you're basically telling the compiler, please use LLD as your linker. And I find this the easiest way of dealing with that because the compiler is the one that ends up invoking the linker. So rather than changing the linker on the system or anything like that, this uh, was the solution that always worked for me. Um, on a full Unity build, which we're gonna talk about later of SFML, this saves about three seconds for free, which I think is quite nice. But even LLD seems slow when you compare it to mold. What is mold? Mold is a sort of recent project, and I'm gonna tell you about that. So mold is a modern open source linker. It was made by Rui. I'm not gonna even try pronouncing his surname. It's the same author that started the development of LLD in LLVM, but then he moved on to this other project, and it's just like um, an extremely fast and optimized linker because Rui really focused on modern hardware, you know, leveraging the cache, leveraging multi-threading, and also picked good algorithms and the structures to make it work. There is an in-depth technical compar comparison here that you can check out later. It's very interesting, but I um, don't have time right now. I'm just gonna show you the numbers. So these are the improvements, right? If you look at Chrome 96, again, on a fairly strong machine, this is just linking time. Gold takes around 53 seconds. LLD takes 11.7 seconds, and Mold takes two seconds. That's the kind of jump we're talking about. And again, this can make the difference between making your development feel like you have to wait for a compilation or becoming like an interactive, iterative sort of thing where you can play around with setting and stuff like that and see them in real time. Uh, caveats. Mold is fairly new, so this is one of the things where things might go wrong if you use it. There might be edge cases and bugs and stuff like that. And it only targets Unix platforms under AGPL. If you want to use Mold on Mac OS or Windows, you have to use Sold, which is the commercial version of Mold. I, I, very clever naming. And the licensing, the licensing is paid on a per user per month or year basis, so you can check that out. And I would recommend you know, checking it out if you have a company and you wanna speed up your compilation times. Uh, there was a question in the front? Okay. Uh, no, so I, the question is, what about Windows? And this very, this says, will support Windows. So Rui made it work for Unix first, then he implemented Mac OS support and some also esoteric architectures. Windows supports is underway, but it's gonna be paywalled behind sold. And you know, you can think what you want, but I think that a product that is this, this uh, impactful, you know, deserves some recognition. I hopefully, it will be made free for open source projects, but that, I don't know about that. It's still not supported though. So you're asking what about the performance of the native? Uh, I haven't benchmarked that. Yeah. I have not benchmarked uh, native Linux tools. My build environment on Windows uses MinGW, so I've always used Unix tools even on Windows. It, but it's a good question. I'll try to get some numbers for the next time. Okay, so we've seen build system, we've seen uh, linkers, compilation cache. This is another thing that you can globally enable and it can make uh, quite a big impact. Uh, the idea behind a compilation cache, like any other cache, is trying to avoid uh, to perform work that is redundant. So avoid recompiling unchanged source files. The idea is basically that you can map this sort of tuple of compiler plus flags plus the hash of the file to an object file. And if you start compilation again, even in a different folder or from scratch after clearing your you know, build folder or whatever, this cache will be in the background and if you try to compile the same thing with the same flags, it will just give you back the object file without having to recompile it, which is quite nice. Common tools that you can find are Ccache, SCCache, which is the same but distributed, but there's also other companies that specialize in this like FastBuild and IncrediBuild. I've heard really good things about them, but I've only personally used Ccache and SCCache. This is sort of how you can see it visually. You know, you have your compiler identity, which is the compiler you're using, the sets of flags that you're using because those affect the generated object file, and then the source file you wanna compile. Now, a compiler cache will likely go for the source file contents, it will hash them, 
and then it will do some preprocessing as well using, it will invoke the preprocessor, perform the hash, and then when you try to compile something, rather than going through the compiler directly, it will first go through the cache, check if that object file was compiled before with the same flags and things like that, and if it is in cache, it's just gonna give you back the object file, so you don't have to recompile anything. It's quite, you know, an instant improvement. Yes? Question is, does it always use file hashes instead of timestamp and size? Uh, I believe Ccache works with hashes after preprocessing. There are a lot of things you can tweak. You can remove uh, the preprocessor step and things like that. Um, probably timestamp is not enough because if you have a hash include or something like that, it needs to know whether that changed as well. So I, I believe there might be different strategies, but hash is usually, the, the, yeah. Okay, so it's a very long comment. I'm gonna try to summarize as the people behind Ccache are clever. There's a lot of things you can do with Ccache, but be careful in distributed environments where you can use hard links for big object files. You might have you know, some issues there. And uh, you know, we can discuss this later. It's an interesting uh, experience. Yes? Say that again? Uh, are you asking if it's available for Windows? I've been using Ccache on Windows. I, I've been using Ccache on Windows on MinGW and it just worked fine for me. I, that's my experience. Okay. Maybe not with MSVC, but with MinGW it works fine. Okay. Uh, not as much as compiling the, the file. Definitely much faster than compiling the file. Okay, I'm gonna move forward a bit. Uh, in terms of benchmarks, I'm just gonna show you the thing that, you know, I'm just gonna show you my benchmarks. If you rebuild SFML without making many changes, you know, just make one or two source file changes, you get roughly 35 or 50 times speed up because most of the things don't have to, rebuild, to be rebuilt again. And this is really great when you're working multiple builds at the same time, maybe you're trying, working on different branches and you recompile the thing over and over again because you have these different branches, but the changes are minimal. So it really speeds up development in that, in that sense. Um, how would you enable this? It's fairly trivial as well. What you can do in CMake, you can use find program to see if Ccache is available on the system. And if this is found, then you can set a global property called rule launch compile, which basically changes the prefix that, that would be used when you invoke the compiler. So basically prepends Ccache to every compiling invocation, and that's exactly how you're supposed to use it. So again, you know, few line changes in your CMake uh, TXT file, and you get these sort of benefits for free, depending on your environment and uh, situations and things like that. And as some people were mentioning, you can also, um, Ccache also supports HTTP and Redis storage backends out of the box, supports pre-compile headers, which is really important. We're gonna talk about them. So it's fairly flexible in that regard as well. Okay. I'm gonna go quick on this, but like, if you have a machine where you're building stuff, make sure you optimize it. What does it mean? There are a lot of things you can do on Linux. There's a nice uh, wiki page from the Arch wiki over here. And for Windows, I tend to look for gaming optimizations. They sort of like help also with compiling. And since I build locally on Windows for my hobby projects, I will tell you, you know, this clickbait, one easy trick to speed up your compilation times by 10%. 
Anybody knows what that is? No. Yeah, it's Windows Defender. For some reason, like if you are recompiling something, Windows Defender uh, real-time protection ends up checking every single object file you're producing while you're doing that. And you can actually notice that it uses up to 20% CPU while you're compiling. So if you just had the exclusion, you say, okay, this build folder, please, I, I, I'm telling you, there are no viruses here. Then you will get a free, uh, you know, speed up compilation by 10%. And you can use Procmon to find um, the offending directories because they might be in different places if you use Ccache and stuff like that. What about the indexer? Uh, the indexer never showed up on, uh, on the, you know, task manager hot CPU processor. So I don't think that's going to be impactful, but it might be another thing you want to try out and see if it makes an impact for you. Okay, pre-compile headers. This is a major thing, but we're starting to get into the territory where you have to do some work. And the idea behind pre-compile headers is quite, quite simple. If you have the same header XHPP and you include it from a lot of different source files, then for every source file that uses this header, you have to pre-process this header over and over again. You have to go through the preprocessor step, you have to tokenize it, parse it, and so on, even, in, um, even if you've done that before. Now, this work is very wasteful. You can tell compilers to preprocess some commonly used headers. So you can tell compilers, hey, this H header is going to be used a lot of times, so please do the whole processing once, save some intermediate representation after you've done all this preprocessing, and then when you, when you want to use this header in other source files, use that intermediate representation rather than doing the whole work again. And what basically happens, usually the way this works, is that the IR, this intermediate representation of the header file, is prepended to every source file, to every compilation unit um, of, of the entire project. But you can also control that. Time savings can be massive, but you have to be careful with this. There are, there's some work you have to do. You have to choose your headers carefully, and there are some drawbacks as well. I'm going to tell you about those. So these are the results for SFML. Without PCH, without pre-compiled headers, we had a 34 seconds baseline of full rebuild. With PCH, we got that down to 28.7. This is without reuse. I'm going to talk about reuse later. And if we use reuse, we get down to 19.3 seconds. And this is just PCH. So if you add you know, the other things like Ccache and, uh, and Unity builds I'm going to talk about later on top, you get even bigger savings. What is reuse? So the idea is if you have multiple targets in your CMake projects, um, usually the easiest way of enabling PCH is on a per target basis. And each target is going to pre-compile the same headers multiple times. You might end up, if you have five targets, you might end up with five instances of the same pre-compiled headers. We reuse, what you can do is you can pick a target, which is like the lowest sort of like in the dependency layer, you say that that target will be responsible for the PCH, and then other targets will use the same PCHs from that base target over there. This sounds great, and you should do it, but there is a little bit of extra work to set it up, because even if you have a, a minuscule difference in compilation flags between the targets, you know, some define that makes sense for a target but is not using the other, that will be considered um, you know, a mismatch in compiler flags, and the PCH will be discarded. So you have to make some work to make sure that all the targets have the same compilation flags, which can be a bit painful uh, if your project wasn't set up with that in mind. How does it work? Well, the way you would do it is you create a PCH HPP file with common use includes. I'm going to show you what those could be. And then in CMake, you say target precompiled headers. You specify the name of your target, private, and the PCH of the HPP file. And this is enough to uh, enable PCH on a per target basis. If you want to enable reuse, which, is again, which you saw before is impactful but a bit tricky, then you have to pick or even create a dummy target that all other targets might depend on. And then you perform the same action before. You say target precompile headers on your base target from PCH HPP. And then for the other targets, there is this reuse underscore from option. And you say, OK, this other target will reuse the PCH from the base target. And you can do that for every other target in, in your project. Yes, I mentioned this. Um, for example, one of the things you have to do in SFML to make reuse work was renaming PDB files to all have the same name on Windows. Like, it's completely inconsequential. It doesn't even affect the object file. But PCH really wants things to be the same. So these are the sort of caveats you might, you might, need to, to, you might encounter, you might need to fix. Oops. 
I would say it's a good idea to make PCH toggable through a flag because if you have this sort of issues with the PDB and stuff like that and you need to make this tiny hacks here and there, it might be nice to keep a PCH um, option that can be disabled. There's also other good reasons for that. Now, what would you put in a PCH? So this is what I did in SFML. I would say you will put commonly used first party headers. You know, if you know that throughout SFML I'm using my error type, my string type, my time and vector two, those can go into PCH. It's unlikely that I will change them very often. Expensive third party headers, for example, windows.h, which is, you know, a beast of its own. This is what we did as well. If we are on Windows, we are gonna pre-compile windows.h. And then commonly used standard library of third party headers like boost and algorithm, file system, IO stream memory, things that you would use in pretty much every source file, every object file, these are gonna be usually uh, the bulk of your savings from PCH. And I'm gonna show you also later, hopefully if I have time, some benchmarks on how expensive it is to include algorithm on a per source file basis. And you will be surprised it's fairly, fairly intensive. When do you use PCH? I would say that they scale well if you have a lot of source files with a few expensive frequently used headers. That's the ideal scenario. Remember that any change you make to the PCH header requires a full recompilation of your project. So if you have a header that you in intend to change or you change fairly often, it should not go in the PCH, at least un until you are done with it. And on the other hand, if your PCH becomes too large, then you might hit diminishing returns, right? Now, remember that this PCH intermediate representation gets included in every source file by default. So if it becomes so big that it's you know, not worth it anymore, it might actually be more expensive than not using PCH in the first place. So you need some experimentation, try and error to figure out what to put there and what the benefit is. How do you determine what headers are used frequently? Um, for me, the low tech solution worked really well. Grep, sort, and word count. You find, you know, I'm using algorithm in 50 source files, then put it in PCH, right? But you can also use more um, advanced tools, for example, include what you use, which has very good CMake integration. It will basically tell you uh, not only uh, the hottest include files, but also if you have some include files that can be removed altogether. So this is a nice tool that you can use, it's client-based tool. How do you know which headers are expensive? We can use something like client build analyzer, which is gonna be the next part of our talk. Now, there's one thing to say with PCH. Uh, this is a problem. The fact that PCH gets included in every source file is a problem because you might end up starting to rely on that, relying on transitive includes without realizing it. So this is also why I suggest having a flag to disable PCH so that you can actually make sure from time to time that your source files and other files are self-contained. You are not relying on things that are PCH is bringing in, but you're actually including the things that you use. And uh, having a CI job for that might be uh, a good idea. Also, I've seen people do this and it's a terrible idea. Once you have PCH, don't remove the existing hash include from the source files. You know, write your program as if you didn't have PCH. You want the program to be self-contained and you have one good header IG in, the extra hash include will not do anything because the PCH anyway is gonna override that. So don't rely on PCH for correctness. Imagine it as an optimization. That's what I would say. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, as far, yeah, so the question is, can you only do a global PCH? Can you do a, a more fine-grained sort of solution where you have multiple PCH? Is that what you're asking? As far as I know, you can do, at least with CMake, you can do a per-target basis with one PCH, and everything in the same target has to have the same PCH. Maybe, maybe there are ways you can sort of split the PCH into smaller targets or something like that, but I don't know whether that extra work will be worth it. It's an interesting question, but I haven't explored that myself. Yeah. It is possible. The comment is it is possible, but there are reasons why we're moving to modules. So, you know, it's, uh, it might be tricky and not worth it. Okay. Questions? Yes. Um, C, so the question is, do I need to configure my Ccache differently if I use PCH? PC, uh, Ccache supports PCH out of the box. I didn't, do, didn't have to do anything different, but I, the documentation also has some explicit flags regarding PCH control. 
So if you end up having some issues, you might want to look at them be because you can enable or disable extra options. But for me, it worked fine out of the box without having to enable those things. But it has explicit support for PCH. Okay. Okay, running a bit low on time. Uh, Unity builds. This is another interesting approach. It's about coalescing multiple source files into fewer larger ones. It's sort of an automatic hash include, but for CVP files, which is kind of weird, but surprisingly has a lot of benefits. It kind of looks like this. CMake will generate a source file that hash includes, hash includes all your other source files, or a, or a bunch of them, a chunk of source files. Why would you ever do that? Well, as I mentioned, it's surprisingly effective because if you coalesce multiple source files together, the commonly include headers between the source files, the intersection of the headers between the source files are only compiled or parsed once. You have, if you have a lot of templates, the same instantiations are gonna be reduced, they're gonna be less redundant because they're gonna be reused throughout the Unity build source file. There's much less work for the linker, it needs to deduplicate less symbols, do less stitching, and surprisingly enough, even incremental builds might be faster with Unity builds because of that, which is sort of a counterintuitive. Uh, you invoke the compiler less time, you create less object files, so less pressure on the file system and uh, the, you know, your processes. And I call this the wish.com version of LTO. You know, you're putting everything together, so the, you also have a bit of extra optimization opportunities because the, the compiler will be able to see more code at once in the same to you and might inline things more aggressively and do stuff like that. There's also this thing where it helps you catch all the violation of compile time. I have an example later, but I don't think we're gonna get there. We're gonna discuss after the talk. And it also helps you enforce header hygiene because if you put the same source files together, and for example, you forget a pragma once or a header guard, you are more likely to catch it by using Unity builds. It becomes more apparent that way. How does it work? You can do uh, in CMake, dash D CMake Unity build on to enable Unity builds. Or you can also enable them on a per target basis using this code over here. And if you have some problematic files that could be there, for example, if you have static symbols that might clash and things like that, you can exclude them with this property that you can enable, again, on a per target basis. You have various you know, knobs to tweak how this works. You can have a batch size of your desired amount. You, know, you can have multiple Unity batches. And you can even set some code that can be uh, automatically copy-pasted before and after the batches, maybe you know, to tweak some macros or stuff like that. So there's a, a lot of ways you can tweak uh, Unity builds and make them work for your project. Um, there's a lot of drawbacks. I'm gonna be fast on this, but many of them promote good practices. For example, you know, if you have a source file scope using namespace, you can have collisions, but yeah, don't do that. Have your using namespace in a smaller scope. If you have preprocessor defining a CPP file, they can clash, you should undef them, but I would argue you should do the same even if you don't use your builds. And in general, if you use them with a poor choice of the batch size, or you, you, know, you have a lot of internal links and symbols that will clash, they might not be worth the hassle, but generally speaking, they, they, are, they are worth it. So in terms of speed up, I got around three, four seconds speed up, which is like 30% on a full rebuild using Clang and LLD. And again, this is just Unity builds. So imagine that compounded with the other things, you get a lot of, of benefits there. And this is weird. We had a CI job for Clang tidy, just for you know, static analysis, and enabling Unity builds for Clang tidy made it three times as fast. We don't know why, but we're happy about it. And you know, I, my guess is that um, the overhead of Clang Tidy having to start looking on a file is quite high. So putting them together helps Clang Tidy, you know, avoid that overhead. But it's it's nice. So if you use Clang Tidy, you might benefit from Unity builds to uh, to speed it up. Okay. So now let's get to the second part, which is about figuring out bottlenecks uh, in your compilation. And I'm low on time, but this is the most important part, so I'll try to uh, cover the, the important bits. Now, how can we profile compilation? Has any of you ever tried to profile compilation? Okay, just a few people. But the principle is the same, right? If you don't know where your bottleneck is, you need to find it. So this tool is amazing. It's called Clang Build Analyzer. It's a framework source tool developed by Aras. And what it does, it parses this, the output of this F time trace flag that Clang supports and produces a human friendly report that provides actionable information, things that you can actually work on. This F time trace was also developed by Aras himself. He's a game developer, and as you can see, game developers really care about compilation times. 
What this flag does in Clang, it produces some tracing JSON files for each compiled object files. And this kind of tracing is very nice, very fine grained. It tells you, for example, hey, I spent five milliseconds compiling this function or instantiating this template. It tells you exactly what the compiler is doing. There is no equivalent in GCC. I believe I'm wrong about MSVC. There is something called VCPerf, which I'm gonna show you later, but GCC has no equivalent for this. How do you use it? Well, you have to use um, Clang as your compiler, so you can simply change that with CMake, and then you use these flags, uh, sorry, this flag F time trace, which ends up generating these JSON files alongside every object file. And then you run Clang Build Analyzer on the directory, the build directory if you want, or a particular set of files. And with the dash dash analyze flag, it will produce a report that you can open up, in this case, just a text file. So you can take a look at the slides later for the details, but I'm gonna show what it looks like. So once you do this, it shows you something like this, which is really handy. It's gonna give you a summary of the compilation time, you know, how much time was spent parsing, how much time was spent optimizing. It's gonna tell you the files that took longer to parse and the files that took the longest to code gen. So you already have some ideas of where you're spending your time in your project. This is awesome. It's gonna tell you what template was the most expensive to instantiate. So if you're doing something that requires you know, metaprogramming, a lot of instantiations, you will usually see, oh, this is the template that's the culprit. Let's try to optimize that one. And once you optimize things in your own code, you'll see that the standard library shows up here quite a lot and it's fairly, fairly annoying. And it's also going to tell you the template sets that took the loss to, to, to instantiate. So basically, my compilation spent three seconds instantiating underscore underscore end. Do you know what it is? It's basically glue for type traits that internally in the standard library is used to say, for example, is no except constructible is going to be something like is no except and is constructible, something like that. So in my opinion, this should be compiler built-ins, but uh, not yet. Unique pointer also took two seconds. We instantiated 100 times with an average of 21 milliseconds and so on. And again, these are fairly annoying because if I write my own unique pointer, it will not even, it will not even show up here. You can really beat the standard library in terms of compilation times quite easily. Um, what else? You also get the functions that took the longest to compile and even function sets in the same sort of like fashion. And then this is very important. You get a list of the most expensive headers. So you can see here that 26 seconds of compilation time was spent on the Windows header. Yes. And 10 seconds was spent on this socket implementation that also includes, you know, Windows specific things. And then this one with OpenGL. So you can sort of see good candidates for PCH or good candidates for headers that you would try to hide inside a source file and not expose publicly in your own headers. So it's a very nice tool. It gives you a lot of information. If you use Visual Studio, there is a front end called Compile Score. It's sort of like um, a plugin that relies on F-time trace and is very nice. It gives you like these nice highlights about the uh, expensive editor and stuff like that. It also has graphs and whatever. If you cannot use Clang on your project, as I was saying, there's also an MSVC-based solution called VCPerf, which has a time trace track and it kind of does the same thing as, as, as Clang. So this is something that should be in your toolbox. It's a very important way of sort of measuring your compilation. Okay. I have 10 minutes, I'm gonna get questions later. Um, what can you do if you see that your bottleneck is, you know, a first party header? Maybe you have one of your headers in your project that is very expensive and it shows up as your bottleneck. The first thing you can do is improve physical design. What does that mean? Basically, it's the idea of figuring out uh, where to put your code in terms of how to split it into headers and source files, avoiding cyclical dependencies, avoiding, you know, um, unnecessarily putting definitions where a declaration would suffice, sort of, sort of like designing your code to be uh, friendly to the physical design of the, of the project. Um, there's a lot of work being done here, especially by John Lagos. There's a few books and talks about it. Um, they are fairly, you know, they're Lagos talks. They're very full of information and stuff like that, but they are quite, quite nice. They basically rely on this idea of levelization, which means you take your project, you split it into self-contained components. Components reside in levels due to the relative, uh, you know, physical dependencies. It's kind of like a tree. And the idea is that the leaf components are gonna be level one, and anything that depends on them is gonna be a higher and higher level. And now, if you properly test the things on the bottom, 
you are always building new components on tested ones. So that gives you very strong confidence in the correctness of your components and also prevents cyclical dependencies, which is the most important part. You have a like, nice pyramid, a nice hierarchy of components. Saying that is quite easy, but how do you actually achieve that? You can start from the basic advice, which is basically separate declaration and definitions. You know, if you don't need something to be in line, or if you do need some, the body of a function to be visible, for example, for a template or context per function, then put the declaration in the header file and definition in the CVP file. Fairly common, but it's always good to talk about this. And I'm curious, did you know that you can also put equals default in the source file? Did anybody know that? Okay, quite a few people. And this can be another useful thing, you know, maybe you want to default something like a constructor, or move constructor, or copy constructor, but you still want to keep it in the source file, you can always put equals default there. I'm going to get questions later because I'm running out of time. Sorry about that. And yeah, in my book, we also uh, discuss this and why you might want to do that. Um, forward declarations for first party types, so for types that, that you own, are usually a good idea if you can use them. And there are a lot of places where you can use them more than you might expect. So here's an example. I have this code over here. I have the zoo header. I have this class animal for declaration. And then I have my public uh, get random animal and add animal, taking by value, returning by value, and then a vector of animal over here. And then in my CPP, I actually include animal and do things with, with it. So do you think this code is valid? Why not? Okay, a lot of people think that uh, because I'm taking animal by value as a parameter, I heard uh, I should take a reference or a pointer. So this code is not valid, but not. Okay, somebody's talking about constructors of the vector. Okay, whoops. So I uh, didn't mean to do that. Well, we jumped at the end, we're done. <laughs> this is the problem with using, uh, you know, JavaScript things. So we have an error, but it's not the, for the reason you might think about. We get this issue about the type not being complete, but where, this is, where is this actually coming from? The only thing that you have to do, sorry, is add constructor and destructor declarations and then equal default them in the definition. And once you do this, this code is completely valid. So somebody mentioned references, pointers, that's not true, you can return uh, a forward declared type by value. You can accept a forward declared type by value. Those are things you can do. And you can even store a forward declared type in a vector without exposing its definition to the header file. And all of these things are possible and many people don't know about that. They, they think there are many more places you can use forward declaration that you might expect. Why do we need to do this? The only reason we need to do this is basically the defer the instantiation of the vector constructor and the structure in, to the moment we actually have the definition of animal because the vector needs to know how to destroy, copy, and construct animal, but we can do that in the definition, in the source file. We don't have to do that in the header. So we're simply saying, okay, the constructor and the structure of zoo, which will generate and instantiate the, the things that vector needs, is gonna be done, it's gonna be instantiated, it's gonna be generated in the source file, not in the header file. And that makes this code completely valid. Yes, quick question. Uh, yes, the access modifier of the vector does not affect uh, the compilation here. Now, is this a good idea? N maybe not. Um, the problem here is if somebody includes zoo.h, they might expect to be able to use animal, but they won't be able unless they also include animal. So this sort of technique I think is useful if you do it internally in your library, not in a public spacing header. So something that you know you have over control over, but if the zoo is a public facing header, as a user, it would be very annoying for me to see animal in the API, but not being able to use it unless I include animal. So there's sort of a double edged sword there, but it, internally for internal headers, this is a very powerful technique and it works quite well. Yes, I'm gonna get a quick question. So, so it is self it, it won't be self-contained in the sense that the user of zoo won't be able to call these functions unless they also include animal. That's the point I'm making, which can be fairly annoying if this is a public-facing header. Oops. And the other cool, the other cool thing. I'm sorry about this. I, I need. We'll get there. 
Yes, the other cool thing is that this also works well with unique pointers. So if you use the pin polydimer, things like that, if you store a unique pointer to something, you don't need to include its definition. And again, I've seen a lot of people do that because they get errors, but the errors that you get is exactly why we add to put the equals default here in the source file. Unique pointers destructor needs to know the definition of the type, but you can defer the instantiation of the destructor up until the source file if you simply declare your constructor, uh, so your destructor in the header file and then define in the source file. So you can make this work with unique pointer as well. Uh, pimple, I'm gonna go quickly about this. I think most people are familiar with it. The idea is if you have, a, um, let's say, a lot of expensive headers or some even an expensive um, function that is hard to optimize or things like that, rather than putting it in a header, you can put it in a source file and then expose only the API in the header and hide everything else. It's pimple means private implementation, that's exactly what it is. So what you would do, for example, here in the Steam Manager, you would have a forward declared impulse struct you would store it as a unique pointer data member, and then in the source file, you would define it, you would define all the, the you know, uh, operations, you will include the expensive headers only in the source file, you do not expose them into the header file, so you sort of make that self-contained, and then you would just simply uh, have public API functions that end up calling the one in the implementations in the source file. So this works well, it can give a lot of you know, uh, benefits, and I would say it should be your default unless you need something to be in the header file, unless you can prove that this thing is expensive and you cannot afford a unique pointer. The main drawback of this technique, in my opinion, is the amount of boilerplate. You basically have to duplicate your API from your client-facing class into your implementation class and then do all the forwarding manually, which is quite annoying. So I wish we had some sort of reflection system or anything like that that I can simply say, hey, make this a pimple and it will generate it for me, but there's no way to do that right now. And again, I'm gonna go forward here because I don't have much time anymore and I wanna show you one last thing, which I think is very interesting, and then we will be done. So yes, this is what I wanna show you. Standard library impact on compilation. There is this very nice website, which is called uh, C++ Compile Health Watchdog, and what this website sh does, it shows you the impact of header files from the standard library on your compilation time. So for example, I can see that if I include algorithm, then I will get around the 36 to 58 milliseconds penalty on every source file that includes it. And if I wanna check the impact, I can find things that are pretty scary. For example, file system, just barely including file system without instantiating any of its templates, results in around 250 milliseconds to 350 milliseconds of overhead per source file. So if you imagine you use file system in 200 source files, then you're gonna get around you know, four or six seconds of complete overhead for your whole project, which is quite a lot. And it also shows you how many lines of code are you know, pre-processed when you include these headers, and it's, it's pretty bad. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, the reason for this is um, there is not a great focus on uh, optimizing compilation times in the standard library, also backwards compatibility, but also the fact that the people working in the standard library are very, you know, there, there's a lot of work that they have to do, they have to prioritize it, and it's mostly volunteer sort of work, so it's, it's hard for them to perform this sort of optimization. Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because um, there are situations where using the standard library might not be the best possible idea. As an example here, there was this tweet which went viral again in the game developer community where there was a source file somewhere in a Microsoft project, I don't remember which one it was, and they included an algorithm just for a single call to std min, and they were paying around 260 milliseconds on MSVC for the single std min call in, in terms of compilation times. And just removing it and hard coding min, you know, with a simple function it was just using on, on integer and floats, saves that sort of amount of time on every compilation for that source file. So it's, it saddens me to say it, but sometimes re-implementing parts of the standard library or avoiding the use of these sort of expensive headers might be a pragmatic thing to do if you want to optimize your compilation times. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that weak time these headers get bigger and slower. So for example, in 14, including algorithm took 0.09 seconds, these again MSVC measurements, but in 20, it takes 0.7. So it's like seven times lower than 14. And the reason for that is that new algorithms were added, the internal organization of the standard library was you know, sort of changed and you might have more transitive inclusion and stuff like that. 
So it's, um, it's fairly sad, but it's, 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 it's what we have right now. I mentioned all this stuff. Um, what I want to say here is also, I tried making some improvements here. For example, I noticed that the memory header in libsyn and C++ includes a tuple. And I'm like, you don't really need tuple to do this. So instead of using like a tuple of a T star and a deleter, I removed that dependency. I changed it to a custom pair. I recompiled everything, everything seemed to work. I proposed this to, uh, to the GC maintainers. And of course, it's an ABI break, right? So even things like this that seem trivial improvements, they are really hard to get in because of ABI boundaries and backwards compatibility. And the reason here was that it would change the layout for a deleter with final specifier, just another reason to hate final more. So you can also see also why standard library implementers might be very wary of performing these sort of changes because somebody somewhere is gonna rely on the fact that tuple is used internally in unique pointer rather than something else, which is fairly, fairly sad. Um, what can you do? There are things you can do. The first one is, you know, entering undefined behavior territory, being illegal, as we were mentioning before. You're not gonna go to prison, so it's fine. What you can do is r break the rules. You can forward declare things in the standard library. There are libraries that are intentionally doing this, knowingly, uh, you know, being UB, that provide forward declaration with the standard library. There is this std forward, which is the latest version, and it supports all of 17. There's also Lightning Talk as plus now. It's, everything is technically undefined behavior, but it works on most platforms. You can forward declare strings, vectors, and things like that. And for non-templates, it simply uses the std, na the std namespaces. For templates, it uses the std forward because it has to deal with default template arguments and stuff like that. And the benefit of this is that you can now hide things like file system, which we've seen is very expensive, behind a source file. And now you can forward declare it in the header file, in the API, you can take your path, whatever, in the source file you actually include it. So you save a lot of computation speed that way. The obvious drawback is this is undefined behavior. So I really wished that like iOS forward, we had a file system forward or something like that. But again, because of this push to move to, mo to modules, the standard like committee also is not really interested in standardizing these headers. And Unfortunately, I think that's sort of a mistake because all the people that still cannot migrate to modules will have to suffer with you know, these extra compilation times. Other things you can do is write your own replacements. For example, unique pointer is something that I end up rewriting quite a lot. It's a nice exercise, it's not that complicated. And in my projects, by rewriting my own unique pointer, I managed to save about 150 milliseconds uh, per source file uh, in the best case scenario. The other good thing about rewriting unique pointer is that you get debug performance for free. As you've seen, the other one, the one in standard library use, uses tuples, doesn't use inlining and stuff like that. Uh, so in debug mode, you can actually see a runtime overhead of using unique pointer. If you write your own using the right attributes and stuff like that, it can actually be faster in debug mode as well, which is quite nice for, again, game development. And you can steal my implementation here if you want. There's also third party alternatives written by compile time aware people, you know, the guys that are, uh, the guys and girls that are a lot, care a lot about this stuff. For example, Vladimir here, he has this Magnum Singles repo that provides self-contained single header replacements for unique pointer, optional variant, and so on. And there's a nice blog post with benchmarks and, you know, you can actually prove that pointer, is pointer is three times faster to compile than unique pointer and his reference is five times faster to compile than reference wrapper. And they are, not dropping replacements, but they do the same thing as a standard. And there's also libraries like Corad over here that are basically sort of alternative to STL, which have, again, is very heavily templated, every very safe and nice APIs, but they were built with compile times in mind, so you will see a nice benefit of using them. I am out of time. There's a lot more I wanna tell you, but we can talk about it afterwards if you are interested in uh, discussing. So thank you so much for attending. I hope that we can have some interesting discussion later. This is my book. Check it out if you're interested in uh, motor sales plus in general. These are my projects. And also I have a list of references here and everything in the slides is clickable. So you will see a lot of information there. Hope you enjoyed the talk and please come pick my brain later if you have more questions.